So hello everyone, welcome to the KSU Open Day and especially here a uh, welcome to our master program session. The master program session will also contain a mini lecture so you can experience being a KSU student for the first time and a Q&A session. As you can see here, um, after our master program session, you will have the chance to meet students, ask them again any kind of question you have, and also to meet with the KLU service areas. So those are the admissions office, student services, career services, the international office, the library, and the student recruitment. So any kind of question you will have, you can answer from, uh, you will get answered from 3.55 to 4.40 then. So to shortly introduce ourselves in the beginning, so this is us, Hong Yan An, she's studying Master Global Logistics and Supply Chain Management, and Sonali Datta, she's also studying Global Logistics and Supply Chain Management. And my name is Anne-Sophie, and I'm studying the other program, so Master of Science and Management, so both programs are represented here. Coming to our structure of the session, so we will start with what it's like to start being a KLU student. So of course the welcome week and also KLU of, uh, for international students. Second, we will talk about the lectures at, at KLU, which are on campus, not anymore now, but uh, right now they're online. So we will talk about both. Um, and then most important for being a student, the student life. So what is it like to be a part of the KLU? We will also divide it in on campus and off campus. And we will give you a little peek inside into our student highlights, the Oscar night and the startup day. So uh, you have the chance to ask any question you have and therefore you just use the toolbar of Zoom. You find it uh, down in your desktop at the Q&A and use this button to put any question you have there and um, we answer as many as possible in the end of our session. Questions are always asked anonymously. Then there's the chat function, but this is just a messaging tool. So we might post additional links there if needed, but we don't monitor this for questions. And then uh, you have the upvote option. So you can give a thumb up for the questions you like the most or you're the most interested in. And uh, those questions with the highest amount of thumbs up will be answered first. So now we can start. I think everything's clear and I would like to hand over to Sonali and she will start with the welcome week. Great, thank you, Anne-Sophie. Uh, hello everyone, uh, good to have you all here. So my name is Sonali and I would take you through uh, how is it like starting at KLU. As the COVID pandemic started last year, there was quite a lot of confusion and distress among students regarding their choices and decisions for their education. And uh, as you must be aware, many universities delayed their admissions. But despite of having such a hard face, KLU took massive initiatives and made sure that the students do not face any difficulties in starting off their journey at KLU. So there were adequate measures that had been ad adopted to make sure the health and the safety of students were met during this pandemic crisis. The welcome week is the first week at KLU where students are onboarded. Last year it was conducted both for offline and online students as many of us couldn't make it uh, to Hamburg due to the lockdown. Yeah, you get the opportunity to have a virtual and a physical tour at, of KLU during this welcome week. And you can also get to interact with students from different part of the world. There are intercultural trainings that are conducted where students are onboarded. And last year it was conducted for both online and offline students. Uh, could you change the slide please? So, uh, of course, uh, we are aware that uh, such trainings uh, is based on personal life exchange, but uh, you would get the opportunity to uh, reflect on intercultural topics together with students from other countries that 
you own in order to understand what it means to study in an international environment, no matter if it happens on the screen or in the classroom. So you would get the chance to interact and meet the professors who would help you guide and uh, select the subjects of your choices. These are a few pictures wherein you get to see uh, like this was back when there was no pandemic, but uh, on an online fashion, you get to interact over Zoom meetings and you are put into breakout rooms with other fellow students wherein you can interact with them with these. So there is no much difference for online or offline students. On the next slide, please. KLU for international students, there are a lot of services that are provided to you. You have the student services who are uh, always there to help you in terms of anything you need for during your admissions, or if you're facing any uh, difficulties when you're in Hamburg, be it uh, the documentations that are required, the, the letters that might you, that you might need for being present in Hamburg for your education at KLU. They are the touch points for any inquiry. And you also get uh, free German lessons at KLU, starting from A1, the basics. Uh, there are exchange semester programs, which happens uh, for students at their third semester and uh, wherein you get to uh, go to other countries and learn about their culture and study at their universities. There is, uh, you get the HVV semester ticket, wherein uh, you get a student pass and you can freely uh, travel anywhere in Hamburg. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So this is just a picture just to show you how uh, online and offline lectures happen. And now everything has been shifted to online. The below picture shows every, like all our professors uh, who teach us during our program. And now all these uh, sessions have been converted on Zoom, into Zoom sessions. And you get to, uh, KLU has taken care of uh, all the sessions that are record, the recordings are provided to you and you do not miss any lectures as such. Yeah, so now it's just the, yeah. So now uh, Hangolian would take over. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Sonali. So my name is Hong Lian. I am also studying in global logistics and uh, supply chain management, but I am a second year master's student. So for this part, I'm going to show you how it would be like to be a student at KLU and uh, maybe take you back to pre-corona era. I mean, as the corona situation is getting improved, I, and I think we are all looking forward to get back to normal again. Uh, let's keep our hopes up. Okay, let's start. So apart from all the online business, we have also uh, numerous offline student events and activities both on campus and off campus. So I've uh, listed a uh, part of the events here, which I found really interesting. For example, uh, the KLU Oscar night and the startup day, uh, which I will introduce more details later on in the next slides. So some of the events are organized by our student organization. Uh, which are founded and operating by KLU students. For example, the events committee, they are mainly responsible for all KLU parties uh, and other events. Um, and uh, for example, they've uh, organized the Super Bowl night. So students, faculties, and uh, even our president joined uh, this event to watch the Super Bowl game together. With uh, respect to the off-campus uh, events, as I mentioned, we have several uh, events and parties, uh, small get-togethers organized by the event committee. More than that, uh, we also have uh, excursion date committee. Uh, they will uh, schedule excursions. So in my case, uh, our excursion day, we had four different excursions, including Airbus, Amazon, Tiza, and Maya Weft. So some of the companies, uh, they have HR and also logistics uh, supply chain departments available. So maybe it's also a very great uh, opportunity for you to get internships and uh, thesis opportunities. And on the next slide, 
uh, comes the epic events, the KLU Oscar night. So this event is actually a byproduct of the leadership and organization behavior courses uh, taught by our beloved Professor Niels and Christian. So in this event, students will be assigned into a highly diversified teams uh, to produce a short movie related to different um, uh, organization, uh, leadership and organization behavior topics. So all the movies, uh, the short videos will be presented at the Oscar night. Um, like the real Oscar night, prizes will be awarded in different categories, including best actor, best actress, best makeup, uh, costume, etc. And uh, the Oscar night will be followed by an after show party, uh, which was also organized by the students. So this is uh, definitely one of the most uh, thrilling, uh, instructive and entertaining event I've ever at uh, attended. On the next slide um, comes another highlight of the KLU experience, uh, the startup day. So let's start from the short uh, introduction video. and startups to discuss innovation in logistics and the business model of the startups. Uh, but it's not only students and startups, it's also companies and academics that uh, discuss here the topic of the day. The topic of the day is um, how can research enable startups and innovation in logistics? First of all, I love the ideas of the startups because I think it's a great opportunity to meet the startups in person. For me, I'm absolutely looking forward to, uh, to the options that I can see for my career and my career path. We want to meet with interesting startups and we want to tell the story about Enride and autonomous and electric transportation of goods. First of all, uh, for us, it's very interesting to meet with other startups and uh, to see students who are potential hires and potential future for logistics industry. Um, being here is very important for us um, to understand the market trends, to see what our competitors are doing, but also to see what is the upcoming ta um, talent from the KLU. Yes, um, so this was the startup day before Corona. Uh, in this event, around 80 startups participated in the startup day. And they are divided into different groups, such as uh, maritime, food logistics, warehousing, last mile service, and so on. So there were 90 minutes for each section, and this section was moderated and prepared by the students. Each startups will present their uh, company and uh, explain their business models. There are also discussion and Q&A session afterwards. Um, after these sessions, participants can meet in the marketplace to exchange their ideas and uh, students can look in for job opportunities as well. Uh, I, I actually got my working student job from this event. Um, there's a get together uh, at night after these events so you can mingle with all the startups and uh, it's a great opportunity to meet uh, expertise in this um, industry, maybe also hunt job or thesis opportunities or even get inspired uh, for your own business idea. Um, as the situation, Corona situation happened last year, so uh, this year the start a startup day was held online. So it's also a new formality but uh, I really think this startup day is very um, instructive and very, very practical because lots of students get their uh, job uh, a thesis opportunity, uh, to opportunity here. So that's my part and I'd like to hand over to uh, NSOV again. Thank you guys very much for the insights from a student perspective. I think they're very helpful. Um, now it's time for a virtual mini lecture by our professor, Dr. Christina Rasch, and she will talk about innovations. And yeah, I'm excited. And I hope you um, like to experience uh, being a KLU student for the first time. Have fun. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anupi, for this introduction. Yes, my name is Christina Rasch. 
Um, I'm a professor of digital economy at KLU and I'm very happy to give you um, a glimpse of at least online teaching at KLU, uh, but we all hope and know that we will go back uh, into the classroom too, um, hopefully soonish. All right, uh, so I want to talk about uh, innovation and I want to get you very uh, active throughout. So I hope uh, uh, for your contributions and your uh, insights. Um, so let's start with this directly. And I'm going to ask you, where do innovations come from? Who, or, yeah, who develops innovations? And if you wanna go to um, the um, menu bar, you see the, um, the chat uh, function and there you can uh, enter your ideas, please. What do you think? Where do innovations come from? Who, um, who develops innovations? What, what types of players in, this, in our society, in our economy? new products, new services. I hope you all see it. Um, so far I haven't, yes. Um, the needs of the customer, yes, the, the needs of the customer need to be incorporated in the innovation, of course. And then who, yeah, who takes up these needs and, and comes up with innovations, what do you think? with solutions, if you like, to, to those needs. Entrepreneurs, yes, uh, uh, very good. So, so um, uh, people in startups, like we've just uh, seen, um, they have a new idea of a new product that could be uh, uh, met, that could be good for, for uh, customers and they um, develop such a product and bring it to market. Yes, very good. Who else? Startups, yes. Um, suppliers, yes. So, so companies, big companies develop uh, innovations, yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think uh, you have uh, uh, in competition with each other, right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. I like your, uh, your ideas and your insights um, uh, in there. Opinion leaders are important to then spread the word. Um, yeah, so, so let's... let's um, 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 let's let's keep it there, and I want to take up exactly what you said. You said you know suppliers in competition with each other. That's like big companies and so on. That, uh, and you talked about entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, innovations can also be um, created in research labs um, and new solutions, new products. Um, but I actually want to talk about yet a different source, uh, which is uh, consumers. So everybody, uh, you and me and uh, everybody else. Uh, um, uh, and I want to talk about um, uh, what we'll call user innovators. So in innovation research, we distinguish two sources of innovation, functional sources, we call them. So one is the producer inno innovator, and this is what you were thinking of, um, startups, entrepreneurs, big companies, suppliers. So in, essentially firms uh, um, that um, create innovations to sell them and make a profit, right? This is what we tend to think of when we think of innovation and where it comes from. But what I want to tell you today is that uh, innovations, actually lots of innovations come from what we call user innovators. So uh, consumers, um, people like you and me in the household sector of the economy uh, and uh, user innovators, as the term suggests, they create uh, new products and innovations for their own use. So think about it, you know, uh, we have a particular need, there is no product on the market this, that satisfies this need. Um, so what can we do? We can either hope and wait uh, that a solution will be eventually developed. But if we are really um, kind of desperate for a solution, uh, or, uh, we are really benefiting from an improved product, then we might um, try to change an existing product or come up with a new solution for ourselves. Um, so, um, I'm going to ask you again, in what areas um, do you think consumers are going to innovate? So create new products or create new, um, uh, modify existing products to better fit their personal needs. Um, so to ask, uh, to answer this question, I would like to ask you to go to menti.com and there you're asked to enter a code. So this is the code. And then you, you can start sharing your ideas about the types of products 
that um, consumers would um, uh, be likely to innovate in, um, to, to modify or create from scratch um, to uh, meet their own needs. So this is the code 8321553. And then I also have to go to uh, Menti, excuse me. So this is the code again, if you need it. And there we can hopefully see your answers as they come up. Um, I'm curious to see what you think. In healthcare, in uh, environment related topics, yes. Um, Okay, technology, that's a broad term. So what kind of product category are you thinking of in terms of, um, yeah, what, what types of goods? Um, I would be curious to know. Transportation, consumer electronics, yes, food. So this developing, uh, de uh, developing rapidly. Retail, consumer electronics, household um, uh, related items, healthcare related items, um, new applications and yeah, uh, and apps maybe if that's also what you're thinking of um, for, for phones and so on, food, uh, clothes, in, the, in your job environment, yes, that's true. Okay. Clothes is getting bigger. Healthcare, yes, household, online shopping, retail. Yeah, a lot, lots of good ideas. I like that. I'll, I'll wait for another minute to see if anything else is coming up. Uh, and um, um, technology is very big. I think technology can be involved in many um, types of products, of course. Um, some, some more than others, I guess. Um, okay, yeah, those are good, uh, good insights. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing. Um, so um, there, there has been research about this uh, question and um, in, uh, uh, it has come up with uh, similar answers um, um, that you, uh, uh, as you did and maybe some additional ones I'll show you. Um, so um, the typical areas in which we see consumers innovating, not big companies for profit, but individual people uh, looking for better solutions uh, is, is home related, furniture related. So that's also what you said, household items, uh, personal health care. That's all you also said that childcare, I guess that's related Then leisure and sports. That's quite big. So if you think of I don't know, extreme sports or, or even the mountain bike was developed by consumers who were trying to go uh, down mountains on their bikes and the bikes were not sturdy enough for um, this kind of uh, situation. So they reinforced the bikes and changed them and so on. And this is where the mountain bike, uh, mountain bike came from. Software, I'm not sure that you mentioned so far. So obviously um, you did mention consumer electronics. So, so in the, uh, in an environment of, of um, uh, um, yeah, ICT-related uh, um, um, uh, products, gardening, car, bike, um, uh, motorcycle-related uh, innovations, and so on. So basically, the types of products that are um, in our personal environment, that are near and dear to us, um, and uh, that we need on a daily basis. And then we get kind of frustrated when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And, if we have some technical skills maybe or some, some, some um, yeah, interest in sort of DIY or in programming or those kinds of things, then we may uh, um, think about creating a better solution that can help us solve this problem. Okay, so um, uh, there are some of, these, some of these innovations are small, like um, minor adjustments to existing products and so on. Some innovations are also quite big so if you look at uh, those examples here, um, I like the example of, of the dishwasher. It comes from uh, a lady called Josephine Cochrane, who was uh, frustrated that her valuable uh, uh, china gets um, uh, broken uh, ever so often in the, in the sink when we washed. And uh, she thought there had to be a better solution for this. Uh, and her original plan was not to 
invent a machine that she can then sell on a market or something. It was just that she wanted to fix this problem here in her kitchen. You see that, right? Um, so, and then obviously later on, she discovered that there was um, a big demand for this because other people had a similar problem, which happens to many consumer innovators, right? Um, but um, this was her original need. I need my uh, dishes to be washed without uh, breaking them uh, all the time. And, and this is what she came up with. Um, um, the contact lens was developed by a medical student in Kiel. Uh, so Kiel is um, a city sort of 100 kilometers north of Hamburg. Germany and he had very, very poor eyesight. He was a medical student uh, and his, he had uh, minus 14 uh, diopter uh, myopia. And uh, so he couldn't see anything more or less. Uh, and he developed these contact lenses for his own use in order to um, not to have to wear these huge, uh, thick, very, uh, very thick spectacles, uh, glasses. And uh, um, he um, yeah, developed the contact lenses. And again, obviously there was a big uh, market for contact lenses. Um, same with these other examples. We don't have to go through all of them, but but you see the idea that people have this this pressing need, and uh, um, then uh, they wish to find a solution. And sometimes this so a solution is just for themselves. Sometimes there is a big need for the, uh, for this solution elsewhere. Okay, so let me ask you again. Um, I've got another question for you. Do you think uh, this innovation by consumers? this user innovation, is this common or rare? So what do you think is the percentage of user or consumer innovators in the population? Um, if you go to your, um, um, I will, oops, I will, I've launched this poll. Uh, so you can indicate what you think. Is this percentage of user innovators, is it 0.1% roughly? Is it 1%, 5%, 12%, 30%? ,000%, 30%? So let's see what you think. So it's interesting, we, we kind of have uh, a majority for 12% for user innovators and then a roughly equal split among all other options, both higher and lower than 12%. Um, yeah, so great. Um, that's, I think you're, you're totally uh, right and you're, you're exactly onto uh, this. The, the, there is again research uh, uh, on this, and uh, the research came up a little bit at, uh, a little bit lower than what you had. Um, so you see here that uh, it was um, conducted in these many countries, and there were representative studies conducted of um, the population. Uh, thousands of people were asked, as you can see here in this column, um, and um, the numbers of user innovators. The percentage came up around 5% uh, with some variation that may be due to study methodology too. Um, I still think that you're actually right uh, rather than those studies because um, um, it, there's likely to be a lot of undercounting uh, uh, with regard to innovation because most people, if you ask them, if I ask you uh, like ad hoc right now, do you, are you a user innovator? You might think, mm, I'm not sure, maybe not, right? Um, I can't remember anything that I innovated on. But then uh, if um, um, the more you ask and the more you think about it, um, the longer, the better, the likelihood that you actually um, are going to come up with um, something and you remember, oh yeah, actually this is what I did. So this is, a, these are conservative numbers and um, they, they are still kind of impressive, I think, because if you, if you think that those are millions of people essentially, right? Millions of people innovating, creating new products and services that may be relevant only to themselves, but may also be really, really valuable for others. So this is a big, um, uh, big opportunity for, um, uh, for society and for, for companies to, to learn from consumers and to incorporate them in the innovation process. So, um, and I think a key point here to, to bear in mind is that digitalization actually empowers you, um, everybody, consumers even more every day in the sense uh, that you have more tools, you get, uh, we get um, uh, to exchange ideas in communities of like-minded others, online communities, social media, and so on. There's open source software, there's 3D printers to print our ideas, um, and so on. There, there are so many things. And in that sense, 
uh, there is this expression that innovation is being democratized by by uh, 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 new technology and, and by digitalization. Um, so that's a huge um, golden age of innovation, if you like, uh, for, for everybody, um, um, helping to create the products they want. Um, and the, the implication of this, obviously, for firms is that um, there, there can be a whole lot of exchange between what the firms are doing in terms of market research. You see this down here in the lighter blue arrow market research and R&D and production and then the fusion of the, the products the firms came up with and all of the things that are going on in the uh, user sphere, right? And the, the consumers. So they are innovating, they're collaborating and improving and giving each other feedback and then uh, diffusing ideas peer to peer. Um, so um, uh, obviously companies can support this and they can uh, learn from this and take up, pick up designs that come up in user communities or wherever out there uh, and, and uh, um, also help market them. So that's a huge opportunity and um, many, many uh, companies and organizations are increasingly um, uh, leveraging this opportunity. So whether it's uh, Nivea that for instance, uh, so Biasoft, they are um, 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 working a lot with what consumers are sharing in online communities. Uh, Lego, they have these, um, you could say challenges or competitions where they invite ideas from ideas, as it says here, ideas from, from uh, Lego enthusiasts um, for new designs. NASA has this, this wonderful uh, thing called the tournament lab where they, they post challenges on the web and then everybody can help uh, solve the challenges. So this one was for how to position the big sun, say, uh, the, the uh, sun collectors on the uh, ISS on the International Space Station. Uh, really cool stuff that uh, saved NASA lots of money because such cool solutions came up. And then if you think about it, uh, every um, um, digital platform like Instagram and Facebook and so on, basically you are, are creating the, the value on this platform, right? The, without uh, um, uh, your additions, maybe they're not super innovative, but, but they're, they're the content you create on this platform, the platform would be uh, yeah, pretty much useless. So this is a... a an increasing opportunity for companies to involve consumers into their innovation uh, products uh, processes. This is what they're doing. Uh, and so I think it's an important message that I want you to take away from this um, before I finish that, that basically, if we think of innovation, we shouldn't only think of companies, um, whether it's startups or uh, big uh, established players. We also need to think of the innovative power that is inherent in, in consumers in the population and all of you. Uh, so I think it's also up to you to help create uh, products that, that you think should be out there. And it's, uh, it will be up to you as uh, managers to, to leverage this power increasingly uh, as um, we move on into a even more digital, even more, you could say, democratized uh, future of innovation. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Anne-Sophie, I guess. Yes, that's right. I will share again the screen. So here we go. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the mini lecture and um, yeah, you had a great, a great time. Now it's time for your questions. So I already um, discovered that some of you put questions in the Q&A. The ones who still um, didn't do it but want to ask us something, just feel free um, to put your questions into the Q&A now. And uh, we will start to answer them. Yes, I think I can answer the first one. Uh, why did you choose CalU? For me, I am personally very passionate about logistics. And I've also considered like other private uh, uh, universities or business schools, but uh, CalU is very specialized in logistics. Uh, and uh, Hamburg is uh, one of the biggest port in Europe. So that's why I choose um, CalU other than other uh, private universities. What about you, Zonadi? Uh, I would agree with uh, Hongke. And uh, Yes, Hamburg was always my first choice when it came to logistics and for, because it's a port place. And uh, KLU was always my first option because it 
I wanted to do a specialized course in uh, logistics. And uh, back in India, wherein specializations are very rare, uh, you do not really get much options to specialize on logistics and uh, supply chain. Uh, you would either get logistics on a different node or a supply chain on a different node. So here I got both of them together and a perfect specialization into it. So yes, I chose it. Yes, and um, maybe I, I also have another thing that really likes Kelly about is that we have a very international and diverse uh, environment. And uh, uh, especially in the master program, so most of us are all from different background. So some of them are uh, studying in maybe engineering background, then they change to logistics and we all from different uh, culture. So I think uh, this is one of the most um, exciting thing that you are working with uh, a like highly diversified uh, groups and uh, benefit from each other. Yes. Yeah, that sounds great. So my example also is um, just the gut feeling when I came to the KU Open Day, just like you are now online. Um, everything seemed to fit what I'm looking for. So the whole structure of the program, the integrated semester abroad, the project work, um, also quite practical, uh, relevant courses. And uh, then the family, yeah, the, the family feeling like that we even um, say Christian to the professor, like it's really um, a private, yeah, a, pr a private room to study. And I feel that um, we can ask the professors also out of the class for, for help, for internships, for um, yeah, any, anything we need help with. So I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that was just my feeling from the first day on and it was uh, why I decided to, um, yeah go to the KOU. Then we have the questions, um, are there any sports clubs and associations at KOU? Um, there are, Hongyan, Sonali, are you part of any? Do you uh, want to? Um, I actually signed up for the uh, Hokshu Sports card, where you can use um, this card to participate in different uh, uh, sports programs boxing, dancing classes, taekwondo, mm -hmm. like it's, it's pretty good. And uh, I think we also have other sports uh, events in, at KLU, right? I remember we have a... Yeah, you can enroll in for swimming and football. Uh, I had uh, come across a few and I'm really looking forward to join one, but it's just that uh, like they're all tied up with uh, KLU and KLU gives you the opportunity to connect with them. It's just because of the current situation, uh, things are just put on hold. So um, I'm not part of the sport club at KLU. Um, I'm part of um, the advice supply. This is a student consultancy and um, all students interested in becoming um, yeah, a consultant and maybe even the big ones like the, the Figgy, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's, a good, um, it's a good training. So we are quite small, only 15, and um, you have the freedom to really um, decide what project you wanna work in. You have the chance to, to even take new positions. Like I started last semester as consultant and now I had the chance to become the project leader of one project. So, um, yeah, I, I really like that association from KOU and it, um, yeah, it's, uh, I really like it, <laughs> say it like that. And then, um, yeah, I see a question that is to me, uh, how was it for you to join at a later point in the semester? How were online classes for you in India? Okay, uh, so uh, first, Honestly, I was quite intimidated with that thought because we were all go facing the COVID situation for the first time. Uh, but it was amazing how KLU organized everything starting from the first lecture, like the welcome week itself. We had got a small glimpse of how our lectures would be. And there are super interactive uh, sessions. Even if you are online, you can uh, just uh, ask your questions, ask your doubts directly to the professor. and. Uh, the professor would 
uh, attend to it uh, with full uh, interest. Like it's not that just because you're online, you would be ignored or something. Well, no, that doesn't happen here in KLU. And uh, it is a nice, uh, like it is a nice time wherein you can focus on quite a lot of things, uh, not just your classes. And if you are in Hamburg, then yes, it gives you some more time to probably work because you are at home and your classes are online. You can fit in a lot more things. You can have time for yourself probably. Yeah, so yeah, it's a great place to interact with a lot of people, a lot of students, and um, you can just uh, come like have your own community. And as uh, Anne mentioned that there is such a big international background over here. And yeah, you can socialize with people. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Coming to the next one, uh, pretty easy to answer. I think what is the average class size in a master's degree? Uh, so in my class, it's uh, about 25. What about you guys? I think in, in our section is like 20-ish something as well. It's like pretty small group and uh, you can have more chance to interact with our professors. Yeah. And also Sonali, 20? Yeah, so uh, as to what I've heard, master students overall, we are all 66 approximately. Yes. Okay. Nothing like that. Okay, so then we answered that one. Um, then we have a question, not really um, what we talked about today, but it's the, are the costs for the semester broad covered with the KLU tuition fees or do we have to pay additional costs? Hamidi, do you want to jump in or? Yeah, I can jump in. Hi, I'm Hamidi from Student Recruitment. So costs, um, when, you, when you decide to go abroad to a, one of our partner universities, you don't have to pay additional tuition fees. So it's covered within the KLU tuition fees. Of course, when you decide to go as a free mover, there would be additional costs, but most of our students yeah, go to a partner university. So no additional costs when you go to a partner university. That sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the best thing KLU offers? What is the first Tongyan you think about? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm a second year master student. So I'm like in the last phase of the, the program. So for me, the most practical things, we have a really good uh, alumni network. And also, uh, yeah, for example, I've told you, uh, I got my working student job on a startup day. And actually the founder uh, of this startup is also a KLU alumni. And uh, also what I heard is that KLU has a very high reputation in, in this uh, industry. Yeah, also because of Kunanago, that's why um, like KLU graduates, uh, graduated students are more competitive in this uh, job market. So that is one of the best thing, at least for me. And uh, another one would be like, we have a very small group. That means we can uh, have more chance to know each other, to, uh, to make friends and to expand your network and also to interact with your professor. And uh, I am about to start my thesis and I have a like close connection with the professor and he guide me through all the uh, structure of the thesis and he's so uh, supportive and also all other faculties and from different departments, they are so supportive. Uh, if you have any issues regarding study or your life in Hamburg, they will always like, they are always there help you. I think that's the most like important thing came to my mind. Perfect. So, and Sonali, you also have uh, one best thing I have quite a few best things, just like uh, uh, Hong Lian mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, firstly, uh, I would really, I really enjoy the practical experience that we get here. Uh, it's not the books that you study, it's about how you use your uh, intellect and how you use your transferable skills and put it into work and get the best out of it. And even if you might be missing on to something, the professors are always there to just like put it into you that, you know, you can think it from this perspective and you can just look forward on it. 
so that's the best part and no matter like even your thoughts might be not that great nobody uh, would say you anything on that they would be like that that's an amazing thought and you know you can add this to it so you, you always have a value added uh, thing that you always get from the professors and the professors are highly acknowledged and like then you can probably think of but they are so amazing and down to earth and i really enjoy the environment here and it's fun starting yes this yeah that sounds good that's uh, also uh, for me personally the main argument it's like um the class is like friends somehow and you feel even though they are from different parts of the world you feel so connected and i really enjoy that you have people from all over the world and you can just uh, find out about the culture and you just randomly ask them hey what are you doing there what time is it what is what is it, your tradition right now so you have you have the freedom to to find out so much about different cultures um if you just ask them directly and i enjoy that also then we answered the question are you part of any clubs so we go on with what's our favorite course um yeah you want to start again Yes, I think for me, I, I love all the lectures, to be honest. Um, my favorite, I would say, Professor Lang's uh, economics. So I, even though I'm Asian, I'm really bad at math or all the statistic things. Mm -hmm. But uh, Professor Lang is so passionate about the lecture and he's so structured. He's such a good teacher. He can uh, explain very complex, uh, complicated things in a very simple and uh, efficient way. So I, I really like Professor Lan, his lecture, and uh, his personalities. Uh, everyone loves him. So I think I would choose the economics. <laughs> so for me, it's difficult to choose just one professor because I'm, I'm in my second semester right now. I still have a few more to go. But uh, right now in my second semester, I'm, I'm having a course on uh, humanitarian and complexity, which is taken up by Miss Maria Basu. And uh, she's amazing. <laughs> and you will have amazing interactive classes. And uh, she, would, she would make sure that uh, you would learn whatever you have to in the class itself. <laughs> like, there's no escaping. <laughs> and uh, like, you would be totally prepared by the end of the day you would know what happened today and all you need to do is just brush up you wouldn't you don't really have to focus a lot she wouldn't she her classes are so interactive that everything would just be there for you in your mind even before you realize it so that's something really interesting and on a very practical uh, manner like there's there's no theory or anything it's totally practical which you've had in your day-to-day -day life or probably which you might be facing in a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. so yeah yeah sounds like a good course um I, i i think i also like the um the course career skills because they um go through your cv they prepare you for any um elevator pitches or um, anything you need for getting an internship. And um, we also had one day where we uh, wrote down just some, some strengths and weaknesses of ourselves. And we had to like do a little bit of self-reflection. And then um, our class members uh, went around uh, the papers we created and then they just brainstormed um, possible um, suitable jobs for us. And then they were, jobs like moderator for example uh the ones i would never thought about like um this is also a great chance that you work together with his with your classmates to figure out uh, which direction you want to go in the future and that's why I, i also appreciate the career skill course because um the yeah professors there they are really helpful and and bring us to to our final goal in the end um yeah then we can move on with the next question which is hard to answer will okay you have on campus classes um in the next semester <laughs> i think we would all wish for that but yeah hard to answer are there any information um hamidi so 
So, I mean, of course, we're closely monitoring the situation. And as Professor Strothorte said in the welcome session, of course, we are very optimistic that classes can take place in September. But of course, the most important thing for us is as well that our students are safe. So currently, we just have to see and wait. If it's possible and safe to come to campus, then of course, it's planned to have yeah, classes taking place on campus. If it's not safe, then of course we will think of other options. But yeah, we, we all want you to be safe and healthy. And of course, don't lose any time. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question refers to the application uh, and it asks, um, is a GMAT or TM Viso helpful in applying for a master? For me, I can only say that I didn't do one. Hong um, I'm gonna jump on this one. It is not required. Uh, it's not one of the admission requirements. Uh, it's very helpful for those who have a background that doesn't have that many quantitative subjects. You know, if you're coming from a law or something like that to prove that they have the capacity to uh, have the income of the, have the um, input of the quantitative courses that you will be cursing both in the management masters or the global logistics, but it's not a requirement for admissions. Okay, great to know, thank you. The next question is uh, regarding the exams and how the final grade is made up. Um, Thing to answer that that's really uh, differs from course to course and somehow you have classes where uh, you have a lot of presentations and no final exam sometimes you have just one final exam totally depends i think that's really case in case so some uh, courses you have group project or you have a final presentation or maybe you have like 50 percent uh, of the group work and 50% uh, of the reading then uh, I think is quite uh, differ from different. Uh... Yeah, it depends on the professor. They decide on that. And uh, yeah, you, you have a combination of uh, a lot of things, just full time, full examinations of 50 assignment, 50 group studies or individual assignments or your participation in the class and oral exams, so. We also have our exams, but uh, because of the corona, I think uh, at least this semester or the exams are taking online. We don't have uh, offline or exam mm -hmm. at campus. Yeah. Probably that would be conducted over Zoom. <laughs> and I also think that the variety of um, exams, projects, presentations, or other kinds of kinds of um, yeah, our exams are for me what I like most because then it uh, varies and you don't have only this one kind of um, way you get graded. So um, Honglian, what do you think, how many days per week are classes scheduled? Oh, I would say my first uh, semester is quite um, intensive, but now we have only applied a research method. Um, I, to be honest, I don't remember how many hours I study um, per week. But I, I remember I do see a question asking me, is it possible to like manage both work and uh, balance the work and uh, study? Yeah, I think for me, the first semester was quite intensive. So it's kind of hard to, uh, to start a working student job. But starting from the second semester, I think it's possible to do a student job. Like you work 20 hours per week at the same time. At the same time, you can still manage all the lectures, exams, but um, it's quite tough. But it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, we uh, really had an in super intensive uh, semester in the first uh, semester, and now even in the second, there are a few sub like the first quarter is quite intensive. It would be light enough from the second uh, second quarter of the semester. So yeah, working and. Uh, managing studies is possible, but then it's it's always recommended to concentrate on the study because if, if you're coming so far and taking up a course, it's good enough to focus on what, you really, what you're really studying so that at least your base and your foundation is built right. Yeah, 
exists. And like from my perspective, I don't have a student job um, and I really don't know uh, when I should do that. So um, of course it, it depends, but I like to really focus on my group works and we have a lot of um, different projects going on parallel. So um, you have a lot to, to cope with different students from all over the world. And then you also have the exams you study for and um, yeah, they come faster than you like to sometimes. So um, for me, it wouldn't be possible to have a student job um, next to studying at KLU. So that's what I would say. Um, yeah, and then there's a question regarding the Master of Management. So I think that's um, the one for me to answer. Um, how is it? So um, I really like that it's uh, general, that it's not focused on uh, supply chain management. Um, for example, I did a bachelor in marketing and communications and it was really specialized. And for me, it was too specialized because I wasn't sure that I want to go into that direction in the end. So I decided to take a step back and to study again a bit broader, the whole management trail. And I really enjoy it because it gives me exactly what I um, hope for. So to get the whole management perspective from controlling finance to, of course, also supply chain, but just as one, one part. Um, and then again, marketing and all different kinds of manager um, yeah, has to, all different topics a manager has to know about. So um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really satisfied with that master program. And I think the level is totally fine when you have a bachelor in that direction, you directly can, can jump in. So there is no further yeah, deep learning needed or something. Yeah, and then the next question is, how can we connect to students coming from India for the semester intake? I would like to answer that one. No one? I was just looking for the question once more. Could you just repeat it again, please? Yes, sure. How can we connect to students coming from India for the semester intake? Okay, so uh, I would suggest like um, connect on the KLU's uh, Instagram page and Facebook page. Uh, you will and just post a comment on it, just stating uh, is there anyone joining the semester intake? Probably that's how we got in uh, touch. And hence now we have an entire big group with uh, everyone in it, not just from India though. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I can suggest you to connect, like just post, uh, 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 I mean, just have a post on your Facebook, on the Facebook profile of KLU. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, then we have the question, uh, what are the major differences between the standard track and the fast track? Master in Global Supply Chain Management. Hongyan or Sonali, do you? Um... Um, I am in the standard track. So mm -hmm. as far as I know, if you want to apply for uh, fast track, you have to have certain, I don't know, prerequisition about this program. Correct me if I was wrong. And I think that the fast track is only three semesters and we have four semesters, right? Mm -hmm. I guess there's no internship probably in the first um, one. I'm not sure. But then, uh, I'm going I, to I jump in this one too maybe. <laughs> um, the difference mainly is that uh, for the fast track like uh, exactly there is one less semester and it's it is the one that normally the students will be going abroad so when it comes to the courses at, courses at KLU you will be still receiving the same courses as your peers in the standard track. Um, but of course, you would not be having the experience abroad that other students will, will do. So in terms of the subjects, at the end of the day, everybody who is studying in KLU will receive the same um, education um, either in the fast track or in the standard track. And uh, as you were mentioning, exactly, there is a certain uh, admission requirement that is having 
200, uh, 210 ECTS credits in your previous studies. So either having a bachelor's that cover 210 or having a bachelor's and a master's or two bachelor's, like you have to have more um, ECTS have completed them in order to be able to access to the fast track. Okay, so now we know the answer, thank you. And we have a next question, which is also, um, I think not for us to answer, uh, what are the options for tuition fees, especially in this Corona times? So, yeah. I mean, maybe I can step in it here. Um, of course, there are always options to finance your studies. Um, one would be brain capital. I don't know if you heard about it already. It's like a financial concept where students who commit to this concept make income dependent payments after their graduation. So they, they apply for a certain amount of money and don't have to pay it back during their studies, but after their studies, of course, this is still, yeah, taking place or is still in place, even though Corona is around. And um, if you want to know more about different financing options, please feel free to check out our tuition and financing website. I will put in the link in the chat so that you can check out the website as well. And maybe Hamidi also for the question of the uh, Tricon program. Um, could you also say where they find the answer for that one? What the advantages of the tri tricontinent program is? You mean this question? Um, of course, in not Corona times, I would say the advantage of this program is that you are able to study on three different continents. You start your studies in Germany, so in Hamburg with us here, and then move on to the Tongji University in Shanghai for one semester and the UTK in Knoxville, Tennessee, so one semester there too. So you have the chance to experience three different educational systems. So I would say this is a huge advantage if you are like, yeah, want to travel, want to get intercultural experience, you will get it there for sure. And then of course, um, the group you are studying in. So you, the class consists of students from the three different universities. So from the US, from China, and of course, KLU students. So you'll be like this big intercultural, very diverse group of students. So I would say this is um, an advantage as well. So I see that my colleague wants to add something, Patricia. Please feel free to add. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just said, yeah, so that would be the advantage. Always feel free now that we're on this question because we don't have a tri-continent student in here today. Feel free to always use our unibody service or as we also call it, ask a student service. You can find it on our website and there there's also our current student Fritzi who's the tri-continent student. She's currently in the US, so studying there. So if you want to get like, let's say, first-hand experience from a tri-continent student, student, feel free to touch base with her. Okay, thank you very much for answering that one. Um, then we have a next question. Uh, why are the classes so small? <laughs> why? <laughs> Well, the classes are not really small. <laughs> they are quite big. <laughs> when you start doing it, you would realize it. And uh, But the only thing is that uh, despite of the number of students in the class, um, it is very like the professors pay attention to each and every student. And uh, it is, I would say, easier for them to focus on them. And it's good for us so that we can learn more and we can interact more. And uh, yeah, I would, that, that, would, that is all that I would say on this. Yeah, I think same here, like, I think it is small. Like we have a like big group for uh, global logistics and supply chain management, but we have two, two sections. Two sections, yeah, we've been divided. We have like 20-ish or something, I don't know the actual number, but I think uh, the smaller group, like the, the lower the professor and student ratio we have, like we can, we as students can benefit from it. 
yeah, like I mentioned several times, you have more chance to interact with your uh, professors and professors also can like um, take care of you if you are a little bit far behind or something. So I think for me, at least for me, small groups are more like an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I think that's also why I want to choose a, uh, a private university rather than a public one. And you, of course you can also have a closer relation with your fellow students. Yes, I think that answers your questions. Yeah, yeah, our batch size is just small, but the entire enrollment is quite a lot of students. Like it's just that we are divided into two sections. Yeah, yeah that's, I agree with that answer. Um, so then we have a uh, next question. What are your suggestions before starting the courses? Um, I, I, to be honest, I didn't do any like special prepare, uh, preparation, but I remember we do have a, um, uh, I don't remember the name, analytical thinking, uh, uh, analytical thinking uh, something uh, by Professor Aswin. So he sent us uh, a file, like you have to, uh, to like um, refresh your knowledge from your bachelor for some mathematical um, uh, topics. And they sent me a file so you can refresh your knowledge and uh, get some prerequisition of your, uh, some basic uh, knowledge. Other than that, I think um, you don't have to do some special preparation in terms of the lecture. Okay, I would also. <laughs> Answer it that way, so nothing to add. Uh, Honglian um, and Sonali, two questions for a uh, question for you both. Uh, what is the strangest thing about Germans and living in Germany? Um, do you, did you experience any culture class or anything you can share? Ah, for me, I think the the most hard part is the weather. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think yeah, the weather was quite weird here, so. Even when we're in the north, it's not that cold, but it's quite rainy, windy, and uh, gray. So you don't see sun most of the time, especially in the winter. I think that's a, the, the tough part. Other than that, culture-wise, um, at least uh, at KLU, everyone was very open-minded. I don't face any like culture, culture shock that much. Yeah, and... Um, you better to learn to drink some beer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, bring a raincoat rather than the umbrella. I've already broke like two umbrellas here. What else? Just, just be brave and to make friends. Everyone was very friendly, even though some of them seems like a bit cold, but they are actually very friendly. So just make your first move and make friends here. Just take the initiative and approach them. Exactly. So yeah, that way, otherwise it's they are fine. They are really friendly, and uh, I really had a good uh, interaction with them because I got the chance to work in uh, groups during my assignment. And yeah, just be punctual <laughs> and do your things correct. That's it. <laughs> I'm gonna put a little last drop on that. Uh, and this, uh, even though I'm not a student, I'm an expat myself and I come from Spain and I was living in Hamburg five years ago, had to leave uh, to do my masters and I am back. So there is something in this city that really gets you in. Uh, you have every kind of culture, uh, more alternative in one side of the city, more uh, fashionable in another side of the city and you can leave really so many spectrums in the same city and everything is like so close by so uh, I can only say good things about Hamburg even though the weather is not the best. <laughs> I absolutely agree despite the weather in winter I, I love this city yeah. so you, you see different uh, things in different corner and you have like two so many things to explore I've already here like for one and a half year I still feels like there are lots of like hidden gems are there and uh, waiting for me to explore. So it's a great city and um, yeah, I, I think you don't have to be afraid of getting bored here or something. There are so many things going on. So Hamburg is really nice city, I like it. 
Good answer. <laughs> um, the next question is, how does KOU compare to the university you were at before? Um, yeah, so Nali, you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I did my first master's in uh, India. And honestly, education in India is rigorous and very broad and tiresome sometimes. But uh, it's just that there people are more focused toward exams and you have the exam pressure on you. Uh, here in Hamburg, the, you have more of a practical outlook to everything that you study. So you are industry ready while you're studying, which is not which does not really happen in India. You just study on a theoretical basis. And when you want to, when you're out in the open, in the real world, then you realize, oh, this is not what I came in for. <laughs> I did not sign up for this. Mm -hmm. So before you get that shock, it's you are already ready. You're in the university from the theoretical aspect and the practical aspect. And when you are approached by an organization or when you approach an organization, you're more confident as to, you can expect if uh, the company asks you a question as a uh, scenario-based case study kind of a question. So you're so used to doing case studies in the university that you know you have that analytical mind to think towards a particular direction. And it's you are, uh, unconsciously, you're there already. So you can give some, if not the correct answer, but then you can think on a certain practical direction. So that is the best part. I feel uh, it's um, here in Ham. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, same, more or less same here. I, I feel you, Zanali. So we are kind of similar background. We're Asia, from Asia. So uh, yeah, in my bachelor, we're mainly, mainly focused on theoretical um, uh, knowledge. So we don't have that much, uh, for example, projects or we don't do that much presentations and uh, here is solar different. So you have theoretical knowledge base and you, you combine with different practical projects. For example, we have capstones. You have to work with company to help them to solve the real, real life problems. And uh, also you have lots of presentations, group works uh, during the lecture. Like you, even though you are introvert, you have to force yourself to, to speak, make speech in front of people and uh, also learn how to work with others, like to have the team spirit. So I think that is the practical part is kind of missing in my bachelor um, phase. And now I think I gain more um, practical knowledge and uh, that really helps us in, for our future career and uh, to, to, to be a team member or to lead a team. So I think that is a big and biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's just a combination of being a hard work, a hard working person. Now you become a smart working person. Exactly. <laughs> Interesting. So really your bachelors strongly differ, both of your bachelors strongly differ from the master KU program, right? Exactly. That's yeah. Because because my bachelor was um, really similar to the KU. Um, system because I did my bachelor at the ISM so also even in the Hafen city so close to that um, but I, I expected it to be the same way but the KU is way more um, yeah practical oriented as you said with the case studies um, I did a lot of case studies already in my yeah, second semester now and I feel way more prepared for the real life um, so this point you mentioned before is also what I what I agree agree on, um, and then also the group works and the the projects we have are um, more related to real problems um, we have to face one day in in yeah our future jobs. So I I didn't expect it to really differ it from the to, from the ISM bachelor I did, but um, yeah I'm happy that I decided to switch to the KU. Yeah, coming to the next question. Um, is it possible to write the master thesis in cooperation with a company? Yes. Oh, Jan, you yes. talked about that. Yes. So you have two options. First one is you write in theoretical with your uh, uh, one of your professor. And other one is uh, you work with a company, you get a thesis uh, contract 
And uh, so you have company, you and professor, like three parties involved in this uh, theoretical, uh, in this um, practical thesis. So yes, it's a big yes. You can write a, a thesis with with company. Yeah, and I think actually maybe if I just uh, come in on this, uh, just quickly, I think about two thirds of our students tend to choose that option in the past at least. Oh, it's quite popular. Yeah, oh, that's super popular. Yeah, especially because uh, you really get a get a problem for a company, and you feel like you're. Um, contributing to to making that company a little bit better or to helping them and it also it's a, it's a great chance for future internships or working student jobs etc so um, I think writing it uh, with the company is always uh, a great chance for everyone and then I just see one more question um, it's a follow-up question how is your study day uh, going? So for example, how much time do you spend on classes, projects, um, self-time or either extracurricular activities? Um, in my case, I would say my working day is pretty occupied by the lectures, the like homeworks, group works, and also work. So for me, it's kind of, especially for the working days, it's very, busy and uh, maybe sometimes weekend you, you, have, you also have to uh, study or doing um, group work with your uh, team members. So for me, it's kind of really tough, but I think if you, you are not uh, working, you can manage it and you still have some of your personal life. And uh, uh, yeah, and again, it really depends on your, um, efficiency so if you are very efficient and uh, very good at learning i think is you can spend less time on it but uh, for me i think um, yeah my my personal life is pretty occupied by everything mm -hmm. do you agree sonali yeah absolutely uh, it is all on you uh, as a person an individual how good are you at managing your time you need to have your own bulletin points that you need to prepare you need to be like to the point and on time for everything. So if you can manage everything well, good for you. Uh, you have time to chill with your friends, have beer. So otherwise, if uh, you just keep it for the last minute, it won't work out. Won't so work. It's, it's, it's always best to get done with it. When you get it, you get done with it within the next two, three days. So that because when you know uh, you might be getting some other work in the next two days again it'll just be an add-on to your assignment so it's just better that you just finish it off get done with it and that's fine so if you can manage everything well it is on your efficiency ratio you can enjoy everything yes and uh, i also want to point out is uh, point out for uh, internationals uh, uh, from my experience the first semester maybe the first or two months is kind of tough um, because of the lectures and also you have you need to settle down you have some paperwork to um, to prepare so the first one or two months is kind of tough but if you can um, manage it you are fine even though the first semester the schedule was very intensive if you manage your time well you you finish everything like before deadline you still got time to maybe grab a glue wine uh, in the uh, Christmas uh, Christmas market with your, with your friends and uh, maybe do a, uh, a weekend trip to, to Copenhagen, you can still do that. So I, I, I fully agree with Zonani, you have to manage your time well and you can balance everything and uh, be happy and enjoy um, living in Hamburg. Yes, and it also depends on uh, the project group you're working with. So uh, we right now, for example, have a project which is called new product development and we have to um, yeah, develop a complete new product and we even have to 3D print it. So um, go the whole journey of the product development and it's a great course. Um, we think about marketing concepts and the cost of manufacturing, etc. cetera. And um, you have quite a time frame for it. So the, the quarter, so the eight weeks, but it really depends on, the, on your working style. So if you have a group who likes to get everything done early and um, in time, then you, of course, have the weekends free to, to enjoy Hamburg and um, 
yeah, the rest. So, um, yeah, also the question, what is the average time study per day? We somehow answered that by the last question. So by saying it depends, but uh, don't worry that you won't have any free time. Uh, you really have to pay attention in class and then you're more or less um, prepared and then you decide on how much you want to add on um, uh, free working and going through the slides again. Are there any language courses at KLU? Yeah, they are. <laughs> so Nani, maybe you can go ahead. Yeah, we do have uh, German uh, classes that are going on, as I mentioned in my slide as well. And uh, you just need to give an exam and uh, your level is decided as in if you want to start from scratch, you need, to, you need to let the management know which level you want to study from and which level you need to start from. And then the management uh, student program, they organize everything for you. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, let's see if there are uh, more questions we didn't answer yet. Um, there is um, the question, is the syllabus covering procurement or sourcing? I think it is, right, Sonali? Yeah, it is there, yes. It is, okay. Um, for that, then we have um, the semester. Yeah, you want to add something? It is in the second semester, yes. Okay. <laughs> There's a question of uh, what is your experience from the online courses? Oh, that's an interesting question. So for me, it's bittersweet. I really miss, uh, like, miss, like miss my fellow students, my friends, and also professors like you meet in person. But at the same time, you can save lots of time. Like you don't have to commuting and you can wear pajamas and maybe lie on the couch while, while taking lectures. So it's quite... So it's, for me, it's bittersweet, and uh, I personally prefer to taking lectures at, on campus. But some people do really like online lectures, so they are more flexible in terms of time. And uh, yeah, I, I would say it's not that bad. Uh, I kind of already uh, get used to this new formality, so I think both works fine. But I'm really looking forward to like, going back to uh, campus. Yeah, even me too. Like I'm quite old school when it comes to education and I really like on campus uh, studies, but uh, keeping in mind the situation, I would say online classes, I've got used to it now and now it feels like a normal routine to me. And uh, when you are learning equally well on online as well, uh, you just need to unmute yourself when you want to have a ask a doubt. <laughs> I guess it's way busy, uh, like easier than shouting over the class. And otherwise, um, yeah, traveling early morning, 8.30 classes in this cold. Yeah, and tough. especially when you're like, uh, you didn't get the best economy, you, you live like far away from the city. So when you have like early, early lecture, morning lectures, trust me, it's not the best thing you want to have, especially in the winter. But then otherwise, online classes are really good enough. I'm hoping that I get the chance to go to campus in the next semester, probably. Yeah. And uh, we're using Zoom. So I think Zoom is quite convenient. We can have group discussions using the breakout room functions and uh, sharing screen. I, I think everything wor works perfectly. Just a lack of uh, human interaction. <laughs> Everything's virtual. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that answer. Um, I see the last question here. Um, it is about the semester abroad and how it is managed during the COVID situation. So, um, for my part, at least I can say that I will go abroad um, in my next semester, so in September. And um, for that, I had the impression that the international office is really doing a great job. Like they, they helped us in recommending uh, which universities to go to and everything was normal. <laughs> so we really could uh, choose the university we want to go to, we want to, go to. Um, and as they do everything they can to give us that chance. And um, I think 
of course, in the case when nobody is allowed to travel anywhere, there's nothing to do, but they do the best they can for uh, offering us the chance to study abroad. Anyone wants to add something or? Okay, doesn't seem so. So then uh, now it's, let's see. I think uh, now it's time for us to move on because um, we only have five minutes left. Um, all other questions you have, um, please feel free to, to ask them in the next session because, or maybe if you're not happy or with our answer or um, if they weren't enough, just feel free to ask them again in the next session because that's why everyone will be there to, to answer your questions. Here you can see um, it will start in a bit already. Um, and it goes until 4.40. And as I said in the beginning, all of the different uh, KU service areas are there and we students are there again. So if you want to go deeper in anything we said, um, just bump into us because now you can see how it works. We will we'll use Wonder, and um, you just return to the KU Open Day you click on the link and then you uh, click on meet the KU service areas and students. And then on the right side, you already see a picture. We have um, a lot of different topics where you can ask your questions or where everyone, um, where we talk about it. And then you can either start a conversation, you can join a bubble or you can bump into someone and you create a conversation. And in the bubble in here itself, you can mute yourself, you can unmute yourself, use the chat function, just as I think you're all familiar with already. And yeah, of course, please be respectful because you will bump into a conversation and you um, yeah, please wait until it's your turn to talk. And to avoid any background noises, it would be great if you could mute yourself when you're not talking because otherwise it's echoing all the time. We don't want that. And it is uh, only available with Chrome or Firefox. So you need to um, use one of these two uh, to avoid technical issues. So that's how it works. And yeah, we're excited to see you on Wanda. And yeah, thank you all for being here, for asking so many questions. And uh, I hope you enjoyed um, the master program session. Bye. <laughs>